Hi, my name is Ed Mitchell, podcaster and web developer over at 4playernetwork.com, and this is my top 10 games of 2019. Scraping by into my top 10 for 2019 is super liminal. As I was picking and choosing games to finish right at the end of the year, I ended up picking super liminal somewhat on a whim. It's a short two hour experience, but there are some moments where this game used perspective and meta perspective to really make me think. While it's branded as a simple puzzle game, the perspective bending puzzles are kind of just there to act as cuts between the progression, and the puzzles never really get more difficult than make thing big so I can walk on it. Now, actually, that's unfair. There are a few pretty cool puzzles later in the game, but the game's true purpose is really not to have you solve puzzles, it's really to get you to the end. That sounds cryptic, but considering the game is only a few hours long, I think it's okay if I'm a bit cryptic about what I mean. Let me put it this way. The game is all about perspective. Go play it. It's quite something. At number 9 for 2019 sits The Outer Worlds. This game was one of my most anticipated games of the year ever since it was announced at the Game Awards 2018. What immediately grabbed me in the trailer was the Fallout-esque world building and story. I've always liked the idea of a space RPG, the likes of which we haven't really seen since Mass Effect, and I really looked forward to diving in. Well, while I didn't get the space epic I was hoping for, no real aliens in sight, and the enemy variety left a lot to be desired, ultimately I really enjoyed my time with the Outer Worlds. The story was pretty interesting, the companion pests were charming in their own right, and while the combat wasn't anything to write home about, I actually found myself enjoying the loop of slowing down time, shooting bad guys, and whacking them over the head. This certainly isn't a perfect game, but I think at the very least it'll serve as an inspiration to give the Fallout games another try. Sitting at number 8 on my list is Wargroove. I have never played Advanced Wars. There, I said it. I was always more of a Fire Emblem fan, spoiler for later on my list. Now I understand the basic concepts that Wargroove took from Advanced Wars, the economy, the unit production, etc. Considering how many games have tried to mimic Advanced Wars over the years, it's quite an accomplishment for Wargroove to have such widespread acclaim for being the second coming of Advanced Wars, especially from some, such a small studio. I really did like this game, for the first two thirds of it. However, it soon devolved into more difficulty and frustration than I was willing to deal with, which led me to eventually put it down. Then though, there was light at the end of the tunnel. The developers dropped a balance patch that helped clean up the UI, made some tweaks to some of the units, and vastly improved the game from my perspective. So I picked it back up and started playing again. This game really is quite something special. The writing is endearing, the puzzle mode is actually very challenging and fun to play, and the post-release support that the developers have given to this game, including a recently announced free story DLC, means that this game comes from a place of heart, and for me, that alone makes it worth my time. Hanging out at number 7 on my list is Supraland. Now I know this game isn't anything fantastic to look at, and the combat is downright atrocious, but if you get past all that, this is a well-crafted metroidvania just like some of the other greats that have graced my list over the past few years. There's an ungodly number of secrets in this game. These secrets can be obtained sometimes through sequence breaking, sometimes through simple exploration, and of course, clever uses of game mechanics. You end up getting to places where you're like, I wonder if I'm actually supposed to be here. And sure enough, at the end of the path is a chest saying, yes, in fact you were, congrats, thanks for finding me. This loop is great, and the puzzles are thoughtful, and some of them are even quite challenging. Like any good Metroidvania, as you unlock new abilities, it changes the way you look at the world, and suddenly you have opened more doors to explore and more chests to find. It's pretty impressive that one person was able to make this game so great, and I look forward to the sequel, and don't worry, According to his Kickstarter, he has hired a combat designer, so I can only imagine that the sequel will be even better than the original. Next up at number 6 is Cadence of Hyrule, Crypt of the Necrodancer. 
Despite the absolute mouthful of a name, the title aptly describes what kind of game this is. This is a Crypt of the Necrodancer game, and all its roguelike, beat-stepping wonder. But it's also a Zelda game. The Crypt of the Necrodancer mechanics change up the feel of the Zelda elements of the game significantly, much to its benefit. Now, I'm never going to say this is a great Zelda game, since I, for one, were hoping that the next Zelda game we'd get would be mind-blowingly good like Breath of the Wild was, but this was a nice romp to hold me over until Breath of the Wild 2. It's a short game, it only took me about 4-6 to six hours to play, but the music was great, the gameplay felt awesome, and I, for one, welcome these kinds of mix-ups in the formula. As long as we return back to the formula every now and again. Honk. Yes, my number 5 game of 2019 is Untitled Goose Game. I will admit, it took me a little while to play this game. While it was at the top of the cultural zeitgeist, I was trying to finish up playing something else or just wasn't sure it would be the game for me. And then I played it. Constantly. Until I finished all of the objectives. And all of the bonus objectives. This game is seriously awesome. While I wouldn't go so far as saying you feel like you are the goose, you certainly embody the assholery that is a goose's general aura. I highly recommend everyone play this game. It's a short romp, only 3-4 to four hours if you want to complete everything, but the little puzzles that you have to do and the way you distract people by making messes leads to many hilarious moments of you running around, honking at random people, and just generally sowing chaos with every step of the web feet. Give it a try. It's fun. My number 4 game of 2019 is this neat little puzzler called Baba Is You. Now you've probably heard some of the other guys talk about this game on the podcast, but in case you haven't, Baba Is You is a brilliant, challenging, mind-bending puzzler where the word blocks on the screen are the rules of the level. By moving those blocks around and putting them next to words like is and and, you alter the rules of engagement, causing things like lava to float so you can move under it, or you can actually make you be win, which automatically finishes the level. There are plenty of plane rides where I spent the entire time staring at one single puzzle. This game is hard. Like, really, really hard. And there are times when you are missing something incredibly obvious, be it how the mechanics work, or just a way to push a thing in the direction that you wanted to go. But that difficulty leads to many light bulb moments, and it's those moments of brilliance that keep you coming back level after level. Fire Emblem. Oh, Fire Emblem. It's hard watching your kids grow up. When I was younger, playing through the GBA games, I had no idea what this series would become. I loved those GBA games. They were simple, yet complex, and they were hard. Then the GameCube and Wii games come out, more difficulty, strong stories, pretty decent graphics, then came Awakening. Awakening was when I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. The game all of a sudden had too much customization for my liking, or my completionist tendencies. Every character had six classes they could be, and the sheer number of choices overwhelmed me. Someone who was used to, oh, this monk guy? He can become either a bishop or a sage. By the time Fates came out, I was so tired of the process of pairing people up to make kids that I realized how burnt out I was, and gave up, after restarting twice. Not to mention the castle sections of those games, a boring slog to say the least. Then came this game, and suddenly, everything cleared up. Three Houses changed the mechanics, both in battle and outside of battle. Suddenly you were exploring the castle on foot, in like a three-dimensional rendering, and having meaningful conversations with your students, not just stupid throwaway stuff where they give you trash. At the end of every week, you were having them choose what skills to focus on, so you could push them into specializing into certain classes, rather than just purely relying on using those abilities in battle. All of a sudden, the amount of choices narrowed, because only a few classes seemed right for characters. Rare weapons and magic were no longer one-time use, because they could be reused or repaired after battle. The game just became so much more fun. The rewind mechanic saved countless hours of frustration because I never, I never, ever in any Fire Emblem game want any of my characters to die, so I'd just restart the level if someone did. I 
felt a real connection with all the characters in my house. Even the ones I stole from the others seemed like they mattered to me too. This really is how Fire Emblem is meant to be. My only real complaint about this game is how horrendously boring Tea Time is. Oh my god. It is terrible. The number two game of the year for me was Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. This is the second time a Souls-like game has appeared on my list, and while I still haven't played any of the Dark Souls games, that hasn't stopped me from loving the From Software formula. Let me be clear, I played through Sekiro two and a half times. First time it was to completion, second time it was just to get that sure ending, and the third time was just to get some achievements. By the time I played it through that third time, I was pretty much done with the game, but I kept pushing. I ended up putting just over 120 hours in this game, because I was actually enjoying myself. Every time I doubted a boss over and over, especially on that last playthrough, I would think, why am I doing this to myself? And then, in true Souls-like fashion, I would beat the boss, feel that rush of dopamine, and soldier on. From Software understands how to make games that feel great especially once you master their parry mechanics. This game is all about the parry, and while it took me much longer to really get the timing down than it did for Bloodborne, I think this game actually has a more satisfying parry than Bloodborne did. I can't wait to see what From Software does with Elden Ring, so maybe it is time for me to pick up Dark Souls. My number one game of 2019 is Outer Wilds. Please, allow me to set the scene. It was a weekend in August. I had just come home from a vacation and my wife had to go to a bachelorette party for the weekend. I knew this was for a rare opportunity and I had to take advantage of it. I decided I would start a new game. One that I hadn't played yet, but I'd heard a lot of good things about. I started up Outer Wilds. Now, although I played this game at PAX South early in the year and immediately fell into the sun and died, the demo at PAX wasn't enough to show how brilliant this game is. You spend the entire game slowly putting together the pieces of a narrative puzzle, what is happening to your solar system. The game gives you no real guidance. You have to figure things out by talking to people, getting clues from around the world, and raw exploration. By the time the game ends, you spent hours gathering evidence and clues to progress, and eventually, you go through a trippy experience that I've told numerous people was transcendent. That weekend in August, I played this game from start to finish, only stopping to eat and sleep. This game reminded me how valuable video games are as a storytelling medium. Sure, the idea of dying and repeating a single day is pretty rote. It's been done in Groundhog Day or Russian Doll. But the uncovering of the mystery could only be done as a video game. By the end of this game, I there's no other word for it. I, I was blown away. And I seriously can't recommend this game enough. Please play it. Just for my sake. That's it. That's my top 10 games of 2019. 2019 was a crazy busy year for me so I wasn't able to devote as much time as I would have liked to playing games. But I hope that 2020 will change that. You might see me streaming again, so I look forward to many more fun times in the coming year.